So after a couple of weeks break, we return uh, to this letter from PRISM. Uh, that's what this series we've entitled on Philippians, uh, a letter from PRISM, because that's what it actually was. Um, it's one of those wonderful demonstrations of, of the incredible way in which Christianity and faith in Jesus Christ turns the world upside down. That this incarcerated, aged man who bore in his body uh, the marks of what it was to be a follower of Jesus through the beatings that he had known, writes a letter from prison to a group of Christians. And the great hallmark of this letter is the hallmark of joy because I'm a follower of Jesus. It's a, it's a tremendous, tremendous letter. Newsy letter. A uh, lovely human letter. But oh, what a wonderful explanation of the glorious divine reality of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we come to these first three verses this morning uh, and perhaps it, it's fair to say they're probably the most difficult words in the letter. One writer, uh, Alex Motter, he actually says these are very explosive, it, sorry, this is very explosive material. Um, I, I, I'm, and what he's trying to pick out by that is the way in which Paul writes here. Because there's language here that seems to be as a Christian, very inappropriate. Um, I suppose, you know, it would be very un-PC. Um, in a day when we, rightly so, aren't we? We, 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 we you know, we, it's frowned upon if we use inappropriate, what seemed to be inappropriate language. Here's this man of God, this man who says he loves because God loves him, talking about dogs, very insulting term in the Apostles' language. And, and, and that's why we need to look carefully at what's actually being said here. But let's kind of just get into the context, first of all, and let's clarify where we are. You notice that the, word, uh, the, the section actually begins where Paul says, Finally, finally, my brothers... Now, there are many who say, well, this seems a bit odd because Paul's saying, fun, you're thinking, well, this is the last thing I want to say to you. But if you go on in the letter, he seems to repeat himself because in chapter 4 and in verse 8, he says the same thing again. Finally, brothers. This is a long goodbye if here in chapter 3 and verse 1, Paul is saying, okay, I'm just about to sign off now. Here's the last thing. The word finally is a little bit kind of, uh, it's, it's in our translation, it's not the most helpful. Literally what Paul is really saying is, well look, there's one, furthermore, furthermore I want to share this with you. That, that's a better way to understand it. He says, you know, this letter, as we know, it's, it's been news, it's been a whole number of things he's dealt with, and this and that. furthermore, there's just one more thing, if you like, or a few more things would be better. So what are the few or the furthermore things that Paul wants to share. Well, if you look at those three verses, it's best to think of three different things, aren't there? And here they are. The first thing that Paul wants to do is to exhort the Philippians to rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. Finally, brethren, he says, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. Many years ago, uh, I took a wedding of a young Nigerian couple uh, in my church in, in London. Um, and if ever you've been to a Nigerian uh, wedding, uh, the, the kind of whole celebration afterwards is just a real pleasure and joy to be in. They always have a, a compare, a host. Uh, and this particular uh, chap who was doing it on this particular occasion, it's the only time I think in my life I've got, I've got near because almost every other sentence was added to by him saying, praise the Lord. 
Praise the Lord. Now, I've got nothing wrong with saying that, of course. It's a wonderful phrase. But when you've got someone saying it almost incessantly, you get to a point where you think, if he says that one more time, I'm going to scream. There are people who hear these words and think, oh, rejoice in the Lord. Okay, that's just kind of one of those frail comments that actually Christians make. Rejoice in the Lord. Joy. Do we really think that the Apostle Paul would do such a thing? No. And here's why. What's behind these words? Here it comes, okay? You see, joy in its purest and fullest sense is the exclusive, unalloyed possession of the triune God. It is only in the persons of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit that the full beauty and harmony and glory of joy is actually known. That is why the Bible throughout is full of this wonderful theme that life can be a life of absolute joy and rejoicing. It's why the psalmist tells us, Psalm 104, that God is the God who rejoices in all his works. That's why there's, 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 there's a kind of, um, there's a profound... <laughs> definition of the life and ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ that is grounded in joy. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. And of course there is a clear, succinct gift of grace through God the Holy Spirit who gives love, joy, Peace. Joy is the distinguishing hallmark of genuine Christianity. Isn't it fascinating that when the disciples were learning under Jesus uh, and he sends them out on, on their first missionary journey uh, and they come back and they are absolutely overwhelmed and excited. Lord, even the demons have been subject to us. We, Lord, we, we've seen people healed. And Jesus' response? Rejoice! Ah, what? That your names are written in heaven. You see what Jesus is doing? He's saying, what a wonderful thing it is to see God's power demonstrated uh, amongst individual men and women and boys and girls. But never lose sight of this central reality that you, my people, can rejoice in who you are and the prospect that you have set before you. It's probably why Paul puts this particular exhortation to rejoice in the Lord in two caveats, doesn't he? He says, look, brothers, rejoice in the Lord. Okay. It's no trouble for me to write the same to you. Literally, the words there could be translated, it's not irksome. It's not like an irritating gnat that buzzes around me and I have to slap it off. It's not irksome to me to say this to you. And then he says, it's safe for you. Now, here's the fascinating thing. The word that he actually uses there when he says it's a safeguard for you, it's the same word that's found in a beautiful word of assurance that many of you Christians love. Hebrews 6, we have this hope as an anchor of the soul, yes? Sure and, any BB boys, brigade people here this morning, come on, sure and steadfast. It's the same word. This is sure for you, says the apostle, for me to remind you of this. In other words, Paul's reminding these Christians that the essential nature of Christian experience 
of forgiveness in Jesus Christ by faith is one of joy. Now, my mother-in-law, dear lover, uh, who I love to bits, has a little small river, a tributary, running outside the front of her house. I think it's a tributary, actually, to the River Towie, uh, further up, uh, as it were, in its course. And over the years she's been in the part of the world she lives in, I have seen that river at a trickle. Virtually nothing there. I've seen it so fast flowing that it's scary. I've even seen it so full that it's flooded the courtyard of a house. Uh, uh, and actually gone in. The Christian life, in terms of joy, can be like that. We can know times when our joy seemingly is overflowing and times when it seems to be almost not there. And there are times when it's like that, the non-Christian says, well, see, it's just like, it's just like me. You find joy in religion, I find joy in, in sport or in, in whatever. There's a sense in which that's true, but there's a sense in which it's not, you see. Because when this exhortation is given, rejoice in the Lord, it's a call to remind ourselves that the God of all joy is the source of our joy. And what Paul is actually saying is this, as much as there is a spontaneity in joy, for the Christian, for the Christian, joy is something they may choose to rejoice with. And the proof of that, of course, these Philippians would have been aware of. Why? because there would have been at least one member or a family group in, in this church that Paul wrote to, who probably thought, gosh, yes, I remember when I first met the Apostle Paul. I remember where it was. He was incarcerated. He was bleeding because he'd been beaten. He was in, he was in chains inside a prison. And what did he do with Silas? He sang songs of joy. He could have said, oh my word, what a letdown, this is God. God, what are you doing? Why am I suffering? No, he sang with joy. There was a deliberate choice made, yes? And of course, even now, as he's writing this letter to them, time and time and time again, it's coming out, isn't it? This letter's a letter of joy. Let, Let me just, for a minute, let me just cap the way that's come out already. Paul's begun the letter in verse 1 of chapter 4, talking about his joy in writing to the Philippians. He's reminded them that that joy is found in this wonderful confidence that the God who had begun a good work in him would complete it into the day of Jesus Christ. He's gone on and said, you know, I find great joy when I hear the gospel being shared with all sorts of people, even when sometimes Christians are not very sensible or even sincere about why they do it. He goes on and says, what a joy I've got, the prospect of finally being with Jesus. And oh, what joy it is to share in Christian fellowship. To make a deliberate choice to say that I will find my joy as I share with God's people. And oh, what about the the joyful implications of the reality of the eternal Son of God, the great creator taking human flesh for my sake and saving me from my sins. What about the joy that God is at work in me? with all my doubts, with all my kind of shortcomings and failings, with all my thinkers, I'll never make it, I'll never make it. Oh yes you will, because God is at work. You see, Paul is aware that the reason it's safe to say this to them is because joy, Christian joy, fluctuates. It does go up and down. But there is this exhortation, this deliberate choice that the Christian can make because they are filled by God's Spirit of choosing joy. Let me demonstrate that for you. By Here's a letter 
Here's a letter, and I make no excuse for this, that was written in April 1772. It is written, oh sorry, it was written by, over the last year or so, I did a lot of reading with him, and I think it was written by one of the great pastors that the Christian church has known in, the, in this country in the last 400 years. You might know him. His name's John Newton. Listen to what he writes to a fellow minister. I am a slow learner. I am convinced more every day of my own emptiness of all spiritual good. Yet, in a manner imperceptible to myself, I move towards a simpler dependence upon Jesus as my all in all. I see and approve the wisdom, grace, suitableness and sufficiency of the gospel of salvation. I'm a sinner and the promises are open so I do not hesitate to call them mine. I am weary I, so I'm a, I am a weary, laden soul and Jesus has invited me to come and put my trust in him. I don't doubt my pardon and acceptance in him, but I groan under a thousand infirmities and evils. Yet the testimony of my conscience under the word is I sincerely desire him and no other. Then he says this, I shared these thoughts with a friend recently. He wondered, here it is, how is it possible that if you can say these things, you should not always be rejoicing? He then finishes, I rest and live on the truths of the gospel yet they seldom impress me with a warmth and lively joy that they should. You see what he's writing, don't you? He's saying, in spite of my experiences of the ups and downs in the life of the Christian, I have this clear conscience, this confidence in Jesus and Jesus alone and this friend says, well, what a wonderful cause for joy. Yes, says Newton, it is, but even then sometimes I lose sight of it. It's probably why the Apostle John, when he writes his letter, begins by saying to the Christians he's writing to in 1 John 1 and verse 4, he says, look, I'm writing these things to you that your joy may be full. Because we as Christians always will remain, this side of eternity, creatures of time and circumstance. And so often we forget to choose to rejoice in the Lord as we should. That is why, as you move on to a second point, we get these words of verse 2. It is Paul warning the Philippians of one way joy can be lost or robbed or taken from them. They're very... Well, what can you say? Let me just read them again. Verse 2. Watch out or beware for those dogs, those men who do evil, who, those mutilators of the flesh. Now, if you're listening to this, before you dismiss this and say, there you go, there it comes to it. When, when, when push comes to shove, you Christians, like all religious people, are utterly, you, you, you're just so kind of extreme. Once things don't go your way, out comes all the, the vehemence and, the, and, 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 and the, the foul language, as it were. I hope I can explain that that's not the case here. Let's ask a couple of questions of this particular verse. Are the people Paul's talking about, are they Christians inside the church at Philippi or are they people outside? Well, there's a couple of interesting contrasts in the letter. 
This is the man who, as we've already looked at there, didn't we, shared with us in chapter 1 and verse 18. He's spoken about Christians who share the good news of Jesus, but don't do it sincerely. And Paul says, well, you know, I, I, as long as Jesus Christ is shared, I rejoice. These people might not do it for the same reasons or the right reasons, but they're sharing Jesus. That I rejoice in that. But then later on in the letter, uh, in, <clears throat> in chapter 3, he says these words. He talks about those I've often told you before and now say again, even with tears. Notice that. Here's something that really moves you, Apostle. Many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction. In other words, what Paul, who Paul is talking about here is a group of people who are outside, as it were, of true, the true Christian church. That doesn't mean that he is saying that they're totally to be ignored or looked down upon. The issue is, what are they doing? Because who are these people that Paul is referring to? Well, the, the answer is given in the language he uses. He talks about dogs. He talks about mutilators of the flesh. And the whole uh, passage is about the Jewish rite of circumcision. Now, for uh, an Orthodox Jew in the days of the Apostle Paul, the ultimate slur, if you like, the ultimate kind of um, way in which you could pour scorn on someone was to call them a dog. I, any non-Jew, you look down upon. Dogs in those days, aren't those wonderful creatures that we now love in the West? And I've put my hand up because I've got one. You know, we pamper them, we love them, they're, they're friends, they're, they're companions. They're, you know, dogs, it's a bit like when you go to Nepal. Dogs just roam the street everywhere. They're almost feral. And Paul is saying, these people who call others dogs, these people are themselves dogs in respect of their attitude towards the gospel of Jesus Christ. He says they're evil workers. And then he plays a, puts a pun on circumcision. He says they're mutilators. Now here is a man who we're going to see, and Sam Godwillen will open this up next week, who have, could never be accused of not being an absolute devout Orthodox Jew. Absolutely. But here is something going on in which causes the apostles to say what these particular, not every, not every Jewish person, but these particular Jewish people causes him to say these things. Now, what is that? Well, the way we need to understand it is this. That at the birth of Christianity into the world, when the gospel of Jesus Christ went forth, there was a gigantic struggle. Such a gigantic struggle that the, the Christian historian of the early church, Luke, spends a lot of time in Acts 14 and 15 explaining what happened. And, and the struggle was simply this. Our Lord Jesus Christ was an apse, was born of the Jewish nation. He was a man who was a devout Jew. He was a man who came out of all that Judaism was. He was a man, Lord Jesus, who himself, as a child, we were told, at eight days old, was circumcised. But the tragedy was that as much as many Jewish people saw that Jesus Christ brought forth a new era in God's revelation, there were those who did not. There were those who actually saw it as detrimental. And Paul is really writing here about a group of people that are often identified as 
Judaizers, Judaizers. People who not only opposed the gospel of Jesus Christ, but deliberately went around and said, look, you cannot be a genuine Christian. You cannot be a follower of Jesus. Why? Because Jesus was a Jew, and you, to be a true follower of Jesus, you have got to do all the things that Jews did in the Old Testament. For a start, you need to be circumcised. If you're not, you're a Gentile. Then you need to keep all the law. Then you need to do all the, the observances of the Sabbath and so on. You only then, by doing these works, and that's the word, can I have hope that God is yours? And Paul actually then says, such things, such teaching, is absolutely so divisive that it caused this language. Now, let, let, let me just kind of stop there and put this in. Some people are thinking, how can it be possible that one man can say, almost in the same breath, rejoice in the Lord, and then talk about dogs. Has this man got a personality disorder? Can he be genuine? The question to ask is this. Why did Paul change his language so abruptly? Why was he clearly so moved, so angry? And let us remind ourselves that we are taught as Christians that anger, justifiable anger, is not out of place. It has to be controlled. There is that almost incredible telling moment, isn't there, in our Lord Jesus' ministry. Gentle Jesus, meek and mild, who with a word could bring such comfort, who with a look could bring such love, went into the temple where there were money changes, people making money out of religion. And what did he do? He turned over the tables. And Paul actually here is not attacking Jewish culture because he goes on to explain how he, he's immersed in it, he valued it. What he is seeing is this, that here is an imminent danger, not just to Christian joy, to the very heart of the gospel. Why? Because this is not about a clash of cultures. This is not about a clash of ethnicity or even not about a clash of religion. Christian joy is built upon the certainty of salvation freely offered through the purchase that Jesus Christ made with his own life upon the cross. The Christian faith is built upon the joy of faith in the Christ who was crucified once for all, for all my sins. The Christian faith is built upon the joy of the sacrificial sufferings of our Lord Jesus Christ being the only, the sole grounds of my righteousness with God. The Christian hope is built upon the joyous hope of the certainty of his resurrection and his return. The Christian knows joy because of the free, unmerited mercy and favour of God in Jesus Christ in saving them. And the moment I suggest, the moment I think that somehow I can commend myself by, to God by the things that I do, by the works that I do, and that's what these people were suggesting. Jesus is not enough. You need to do these things. Paul says, you've lost the gospel. You've absolutely lost the authentic, free offer of the gospel by faith in Jesus Christ. There's, there's, there's a clash of the titans here, if you like. 
And it's simply this. Am I saved by faith through God's grace in Jesus Christ alone? Am I trusted in Jesus Christ, his righteousness for me alone? Or do I trust in what I do or who I am or my background? Do I trust in my works? And the problem is that the Christian life and the life of the Christian church is littered with these contrasts that lie at the heart of the gospel. Those things that would somehow take away, my wife's going to tell me off for quoting this, but I, I, I love this, uh, that would take away from this, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. It was that that caused the apostle to be so concerned. To use this word, beware, there's an imminent danger here. But let's go on, because the third thing Paul does here is to just give these Christians in Philippi some reasons to rejoice. And again, he does something that, 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 that to many of his contemporaries would have been unthinkable. He says, doesn't he, in verse 3, look, here it is, for it is we who are. It is we who are the circumcision. There's these people saying to you Christians, you Gentile Christians particularly, look, you need to be circumcised. They totally misunderstood it. Actually, we are, I am, by the grace of God, you are as a Christian, we are the circumcised. <laughs> that is, the impact of that uh, to, to, to those who oppose Paul would have been profound. They would have been absolutely shell-shocked. Some translations, in order to bring it out, actually use the word, we are the real circumcision. It's actually, that word, real, is not in the Greek. The power of what Paul is saying is simply this. We are, we are exclusively, if you like. We are the circumcision. That's why when he wrote to the church at Ephesus, which was mainly uh, by and large a Gentile congregation, he says, do you remember once what you were like? He says, when you were Gentiles, you had no hope, of, you didn't know God, you had no hope, no love of Christ, you were totally isolated. But now, we strangers, strangers to the God's covenant, we belong. Because what is circumcision? Or should I say, what was circumcision? It was the sign that God gave to his people of old that they belonged to him, that they were in a covenant agreement with him. Circumcision was nothing other than a simple symbol, a sign of the reality of what they were meant to be. And that is why, of course, throughout the Old Testament, there's this constant pointing away from that covenant to a new covenant. He could say to these Christians at Philippi, we are the circumcision. Why? Because even in the page of the Old Testament, God said to his people time and time and time again, look, don't you understand, this sign of circumcision is to teach you, is your heart circumcised? Has it actually been changed? Has it been transformed? Deuteronomy 10, uh, the Lord teaches that. And, and Paul picks up in Romans chapter 2, doesn't he? He says, look, we are those who have been circumcised by the Spirit in the heart. This sign is meant to represent something that's happened to you inwardly. And you Christians, he says at Philippi, you're simply those who in the mercy of God have inherited the covenant promises and prophecies of the Old Testament. Probably most succinctly put in Jeremiah 31. 
This is what I will do, says God. I will make a new covenant with you. I will put my law in your minds and write them on your heart. I will be your God and you will be my people. It's why the Apostle Paul reminds us every time we come around the Lord's table, our Lord Jesus taught, this blood is the new covenant. What was promised of old is now being fulfilled in you. I've not got enough time to open this up, but I want to suggest to you that what we're dealing with here is this. It's that it it comes up in the Christian life and thinking lots of times. it's, It's getting to understand the right relationship between what God revealed in the Old Testament and promised and how it developed and now actually is fulfilled in the New Testament. It's, it's, there's a whole number of planes in which this is worked out, and here is one of them. What is the place? What was the place of circumcision? It was a sign of a promise, of an inward reality of God's Spirit that actually is fulfilled now in men and women and boys and girls who have come to Jesus. And that's why he points three things in this verse 3. He says, you Christians are to rejoice in the Lord. Why? Because we are those who worship God in spirit. Wow, what a a depth of, of beauty there are in those words. I want to suggest to you that one of the most insightful, beautiful conversations that our Lord Jesus Christ had on earth was on a hot midday outside a place called Samaria where he spoke to a woman whose life was in such moral tatters that even by a society which she would consider an outcast. How many husbands have you had? Only a few. Really? And yet to this dear, dear woman, Jesus says these incredible words. Because she suddenly starts to think, actually, this this guy's talking, he's saying that actually, this faith he's talking about in him, it can change me, really? And Jesus says, look, he says, my dear, dear, dear lady, true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. And here it comes. God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And when Paul says we are the circumcision, the true circumcision if you like, the proof is is that we now by the grace of God through Jesus Christ and through Jesus Christ alone we can worship God in spirit because he has sent him into our hearts. And it is the most precious thing we possess and anything that would somehow seek to undermine that or take it away not only destroys the true reality of the gospel, not only hinders our life of faith, not only subdues the love of God that should fill our hearts. It means we've lost a message that the world desperately needs to hear. Whoever you are, whatever you've done, whatever your cultural distinction, whatever your national background, no matter how you may have thought you have lived a life totally immoral and corrupt, you may freely come to Jesus Christ because he and he alone offers salvation. Look this morning. Listen to me, you you young people here. Wherever you go in life today, whatever your hope is, there is never no, there will never be anyone, there will never be anything that can satisfy like Jesus Christ. And he loves you freely. And he offers freely that which you and I could never in a million years possess or find. 
And dare I as a Christian, dare I for one minute, which I, I, there's a sto- I'll share it another time, a story I do in this part of the world, tragic. Dare I say, do you know what? You can't be a Christian because you're wearing a hoodie. You can't be a Christian because you don't put a tie on. You can't be a Christian because you don't speak with tongues. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. And by the grace of God, because of that simple trust, I worship God in the Spirit. Paul says, I rejoice in Christ. I and, and, and the, the word rejoice there is not the best one. Uh, the best word there is I boast. Paul, when he writes to the Galatians, dealing with a similar, similar issue, he says this, God forbid, he says, that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's a, exactly the same word. Paul's saying, can you see Why? I, I, you know, and boast can be a word that can be so misappropriate, can't appropriated, can't it? But in this sense, what Paul is saying, I have one sole reason alone to stand up and say, thank you, God, I boast in this, I boast in Jesus. Jesus alone is my only hope. And I've got no confidence in the flesh. And what Sam is going to do, God willing, next week is open up the apostle explaining that. Why has he got no confidence in the flesh? Why does he rejoice in Jesus alone? He's going to go on to explain. But let me finish by sharing the words of a hymn of the man who I spoke of already this morning, the great John Newton. you probably tell me off for saying that about him. Wretched man. Slave trader. His life was so immersed in corruption that he ended up a slave himself. And by the grace of God, he heard that there was one who said, I love you. I will save you. My name is Jesus. Here's one of his hymns. I close with this just opening verse. He wrote, Rejoice, believer in the Lord. Here's a bit that's lovely. Who makes your cause his own. The hope that's built upon his, Jesus' word, shall never be overthrown. Is that your confidence this morning? Is that your hope? 2023. The long forgotten man of history, supposedly, Jesus. Really? He's here. He's here by his spirit. He's here with his people. He's saying to you this morning, if you're not a Christian, will you not come? Will you not build a hope and a certainty on, on, on my free offer of the gospel? Don't care what you've done. Don't care. I can be this, but I don't care where you've been. I don't care what kind of things you've been immersed in. I love freely. I save freely. I died willingly. I rose by the power of God gloriously. I live so that you might be free. Hallelujah. Forgive me, I've got to keep it carried away. What a saviour. Let's pray, let's pray. Our God and our Father, we come to this This letter this man wrote, incarcerated in a a Roman jail, yet so full of the joy 
of knowing Jesus Christ. So utterly convinced through experience and teaching that there was no joy like the joy of being loved and known by Jesus. That as a Christian he stood by faith and by faith alone and there was nothing that he could bring, nothing that he could trust in, but by simply clinging, even if by his fingernails, to Jesus and Jesus alone, there was a joy that was eternal because it was a joy that was found in the God that you are. A God of joy who rejoices in who he is in what he has made and above all rejoices in that wonderful work of redemption that he is fulfilling until that day he completes it when Jesus comes again. Oh Lord, we come as sinners but we thank you that we come in Jesus. Accept our praise and our thanks. Amen.